Hey everyone. In today's lecture, we're going to discuss the one skill I'd really like you to take from this class. Not only that, but it's a skill that will help you be a more thoughtful, responsible, and careful person throughout your whole life. Now, I'm not kidding. Today we're talking about close reading. Now, I don't mean this. But you probably knew that. And here's the first point about close reading. Close reading involves a skill set that you already have and use every day. No matter if you think you're a bad student, or English isn't your first language, or whatever, I guarantee you that you are capable of being a good close reader. Because really, close reading is retuning and reapplying skills you already have and use every day. For example, when I said close reading earlier, some of you might have thought of somebody reading a book really closely to their face. But even if you thought that, you probably thought that's not what I meant. Why would anybody need to read a book that closely to their face? Unless they're nearsighted. And even in that case, how could it make somebody a more thoughtful, careful, or responsible person? You probably assumed that I meant close in a different sense. And that means you have a sense of the context of our discussion. And knowing about context, and thinking about context, is an important part of close reading. So what is close reading? Close reading is a type of reading that pays close attention to details in order to interpret a passage of text. So what details should you pay attention to? We'll go through each of these points one by one. Word choice. Writers can use any and all of the words of an entire language, and plenty of writers use words from more than one language. Every word not only has a specific meaning, like what you'd find in a dictionary, but also a set of connotations that might go beyond what a word literally means. For example, the word metastasize literally means to spread to other parts of the body by way of the blood or lymphatic vessels or membranous surfaces. But it can also mean to spread injuriously or to transform, especially into a dangerous form. You've probably heard the word used in reference to cancer moving from one part of the body to another. John's lung cancer metastasized to his lymph nodes, for example. So if, as in number two, an author uses metastasize to describe something growing or moving, the author is using a specific word choice with connotations of cancer, growth, and danger, which leads us to imagery. When I referenced the connotations of a word, I began to talk about a word's imagery. The ways and words writers use to describe characters, places, objects, emotions, or anything create certain images in our mind. When close reading, look for patterns and repetitions. Does a writer tend to compare people's skin colors to food? Or do they tend to write about technology using words we normally use to describe nature? Is their language plain, leaving the details up to the reader's imagination? Or is it verbose and highly descriptive? Remember, writers have control over what kinds of words they use, and they choose specific words and images for specific reasons. Why might they have made those choices? What are they trying to show us? Tone. I'm fine can mean many different things depending on the tone of how you say it. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. In those few examples, it means I'm not fine and I'm angry, everything's all right, I'm very attractive, and I'm not fine and I'm sad. In short, what we say is always as important as how we say it. In writing, we don't have a literal tone of voice to guide us like we did in the example, but authors can use specific kinds of words to create certain tones. Does a narrator seem all-knowing or doubtful? Are they snarky or serious? Tone will affect how you interpret word choice, as will context. Context refers not as much to the words or phrases an author uses, but the circumstances, history, and facts surrounding the words and phrases an author uses. There are two kinds of context to consider, verbal context and social context. Verbal context refers to the words and phrases surrounding a particular word or expression, like tone, context deeply influences the way that we interpret a phrase or word. For example, take the following two sentences. Quote, she kicked a piece of trash on the ground and punched the wall hard. I'm fine, she spat. 
end quote. The context in which this character tells us she's fine, that she spits the words out rather than says them, and that she does so after reacting violently to her environment, clues us in to suspect that the character isn't saying I'm fine to mean that everything is all right. Social context is a bit trickier because it appears on at least two levels, the context of the author while he or she was writing the text, and the context in which the reader is encountering the text. It's important to consider what the social variables that might have affected the author. When they were writing, where they were writing, how old is the author, what is their gender, their race, their class. Just as these factors influence who you are, how you think, and how you understand the world, these factors also would have influenced an author's opinions, thoughts, and how they write. A writer's opinions and thoughts on the world and how the world works are not infallible. And some of the authors we will read may hold opinions or ideas you disagree with. You don't have to agree with them, but in order to be a responsible reader, you should at least be aware of the context in which the author was writing and in which you are responding. So here's an example to help us explore social context. One short sentence. John was a communist. In many parts of the world, saying that John was a communist means you're just describing one point on a political spectrum. It would be as normal as saying John was a Republican or a Democrat in the United States. But in the U.S., the fever of the Cold War led many people to believe and has kept a lingering sort of presence in American culture and thought that communists were the next Nazis. That isn't true all over the world. Nor is it true at all times. For example, in the U.S. before World War II, there were over 100,000 members of the Communist Party of the USA. So if an author was Soviet or American and wrote John was a communist in, say, a 1957 novel, their context would mean that they were saying something very different. Likely, the American author would be saying that John was kind of a bad guy, whereas the Soviet person would be saying that John was a good citizen. Even in the same culture at different times, a single detail of social context can change the meaning. So saying John was a communist as an American author in 1914, in 1957, and in 2014 have very different connotations. When we think about social context, we also not only want to think about the context in which the author was writing, but also the context in which we're reading. So, for example, our hypothetical novel, including the sentence, John was a communist, might have been written by an American in 1914. They didn't mean anything particularly villainous. But somebody reading it in 1957 would probably think that John was a bad guy, at least if they were reading it in America. If they were reading it in the USSR, they might think of him as a good citizen. Both of those might be very far off from what the author sort of intended when they wrote it in 1914. And we'll talk more about author and reader relationships in the future. Literary devices. Like any art form, literature has a series of devices or techniques that writers can use to influence a reader. There are a lot of possible devices, and in this module I've provided a link to a page on literary devices for you to examine. The whole list is interesting, but if you are not already familiar, please review the following devices to which we will likely refer over the course of the class, some of which I've already referred to. Allegory, Illusion, Archetype, Foreshadowing, hyperbole, imagery, irony, metaphor, motif, paradox, personification, point of view, simile, and verisimilitude. Whew, I know it's a lot to take in. How do you keep track of it all in your head? You kind of don't. It's actually really important to take notes. Right now we'll run through a few steps that can help you sort of structure your close reading notes but I do recommend having a notebook nearby, and maybe you wanna print out the handout that I've provided for you on Canvas. So here's a checklist for you to keep in mind while you're working on close reading. First off, close reading is active reading. You're doing more than just letting your eyes run across the page. I recommend marking up your book. Use a pencil or highlighters to underline or highlight or write quick thoughts on the side of a text. If you don't like to mark books, use sticky notes or keep detailed notes on separate paper. Also note that in this module I have a page on how to use PDF readers like Preview and Adobe 
to take notes on the electronic reading that we'll be doing, the PDFs of articles and short stories. Part of active reading means that you'll also have a notebook nearby. Maybe you'll use a traditional notebook, maybe you use your computer. The form doesn't matter. What's important is that you write down your thoughts on passages, the things that you notice, the things you think might be important for later. Be sure to note the page numbers. Write down questions you have or ideas for your discussion boards while you're reading. It's much easier to do it then than to scrabble to remember who said what and where three days after you've read the book. So if you're taking notes, what kinds of things should you mark or note? Well, for longer texts, such as the novels or the longer short stories, point out passages or sections that you think are important to the plot or theme. While on the one hand every word is important, on the other, sometimes some words are more important than others. So mark the passages and sections you think are more important to the overarching theme of the story. You'll also want to mark words or phrases that strike you as important in establishing the tone, the theme, the mood, the context, or imagery. Mark any words you don't know and look them up. Note the definition. Mark strange or surprising word choices. If an author is trying to surprise you, they're trying to get a reaction out of you. If something strikes you as a little weird or odd, it might be important. Also mark down repeated words, phrases, or images. These are called motifs. Finally, mark any significant literary devices. If a major metaphor is being used or personification is being used repeatedly, it's worth pointing those out. Finally, most close readers will frequently read passages more than once, especially passages that are important or that are particularly confusing or difficult. You may think this sounds impossibly daunting, especially for longer stories and novels. With these texts, it probably is impossible to mark every single interesting or unique phrase or every single repeated word. Follow your gut. You will find some details are more important and significant than others. Like any skill, close reading takes practice. The more you read, the better you will become at recognizing details and discerning what is important. Pay careful attention to passages, sections, and sentences that you think are particularly important or significant. Sometimes you'll realize an earlier passage is important only once you've read further on in the text, so that's another reason it's important to keep good notes about what happens and when. Next time we're going to talk about the why of close reading. What do we use these skills for? Interpretation. And it's close cousin, literary theory. See you then.